Great. So as Mohammed said, my paper is called Emotion and Reason in Political Language. This is joint work with uh, Gloria Gennaro, who is a postdoc at ETH Zurich. I'm an assistant professor there. And uh, we have our uh, one paper already um, uh, ready to go and a working paper out, but I hope that you'll see that uh, this method and uh, this substantive quantity of emotionality, emotion and logic in language is something that could be applied in many domains. And I, I hope that, uh, that some of our um, machinery and um, our, our approach could be useful in some of your work. So this is an old issue. Uh, you know, we've, we have the classic Aristotle quote um, that uh, an emotional speaker makes his audience feel with him even when there's nothing in his arguments, which is why many speakers try to overwhelm their audience by mere noise. And this is the classic uh, pathos and logos uh, as being these, these two uh, sources of rhetoric for persuading people. Uh, more more uh, recently, uh, Drew Weston says, in politics, when reason and emotion collide, emotion invariably wins. So we're going to see if it, you know, in if, if this is true in some kind of basic sense, then, you know, politicians should not even have any logic, right? <laughs> they should just use just emotion. Uh, but we'll see, we'll see they use both. Uh, this is a part of a, a broader literature in psychology, uh, political science, uh, which has, uh, there's been a lot of, uh, of uh, psychology work, in, you know, looking at uh, emotions, it, when people um, make political decisions, uh, but there isn't any work uh, up until very recently uh, looking at um, uh, uh, measuring emotions in text or really trying to analyze uh, the emotional intensity uh, in the wild uh, because there hasn't been a, um, a, a data set for doing so. Uh, I would say that, that positive sentiment, so like positive versus negative language, that's widely studied. Uh, but emotional intensity in terms of saying, you know, am I, uh, you know, emotionally expressive right now? Uh, that's that's more new. Uh, the the one of the closest papers is uh, Diedrich et al. Um, who they look at emotional intensity in audio, so they measure it in um, in uh, in sound. Uh, there's also uh, I, I should have done this. I didn't update the slides, but just a couple of days ago, a paper came out actually uh, in uh, uh, American Political Science Review, one of the top political science journals. Uh, doing something quite similar to us uh, in uh, in the United Kingdom for some recent data, uh, which I can talk about if you guys are interested. Um, and then um, separately, we're contributing to this this uh, this literature and natural language processing, computational social science, uh, which is using some some of these uh, these newer um, uh, um, uh, NLP models to analyze uh, social attitudes, uh, stereotypes, uh, and other cultural dimensions in language. So what are we doing in this paper? First, we ask, how can we detect emotion and reason in political speech? And so we're going to assume there's just the single dimension, uh, which we'll see in a human validation, uh, that it's actually a, a pretty, pretty good assumption. And um, we're going to combine a dictionary or lexicon-based approach where we have a group of uh, emotive words and a group of cognitive words and uh, use word embeddings, which uh, are a spatial representation of language. Uh, we're going to use that to trace a dimension, trace a, a direction in language corresponding uh, towards reason or, or a cognition on one end, logos on one end, and then emotion or affect or pathos on the other end. And then we're going to apply this to uh, U.S. Congress, and uh, this is just a nice setting uh, for uh, economic history, uh, social science, uh, his historical social science, uh, because we have 150 years of speeches about politics in the U.S., uh, and we can trace the emotional expression over time across topics, uh, including some policy topics that are going to be interesting uh, to economists, such as fiscal policy, we're going to relate it to individual and institutional characteristics. And I have time today to show you uh, the next paper we want to work on, which is taking a uh, looking at performing a causal analysis of uh, transparency or visibility of politicians on the, the amount of emotion that they express in, in their speeches. 
So our method in, and um, I, sh I should mention, uh, I know that um, for a technical presentation like this, you might not want to wait for the Q&A to ask questions. Uh, and so, you know, given that I think we have plenty of time, so so feel free to, to just raise your hand or un unmute yourself if you have a question about anything that I say. Uh, the corpus, as I mentioned, is 150 years of speeches from the US Congress. It's almost 10 million speeches. Uh, we perform some standard pre-processing in the text as data literature. We extract only nouns, adjectives, and verbs. This is because these words are relatively informative uh, for getting at you know kind of emotional content, and uh, it, it's, it serves to drop uh, function words uh, that won't be uh, informative about emotional expression. After that, we drop punctuation, capitalization, and numbers, and uh, we drop the word endings. So like taxes and tax would both become tax, for example. Uh, we, we also, we just drop rare words. Uh, and so the final vocabulary is 63,000 words. And then uh, we train word to vec which is a word embedding model, which I'll talk about more in a second. So word embeddings is this relatively new technology. Um, it's, you know, it feels new in social science, uh, but it's actually um, the, the, the first paper on this is from 2013. Uh, but uh, you know the, the technology the, in the literature in NLP is changing really fast. Um, but uh, word embeddings is this, is this now fundamental or foundational technology in natural language processing and computational linguistics, where words and phrases and also documents are represented with a spatial uh, in a, in a, they take a spatial representation, where uh, the this is a high dimensional space. It's like 300 dimensions, uh, but it's very low dimensional relative to the vocabulary, which has you know 65,000 items in it. And every word gets a space, it gets a, gets a, 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 a point in this space. And um, so the first, um, the first uh, quality, the characteristic of these of these vectors is that words that are related to each other, such as you know student and pupil, they're going to be close to each other in the space. So it's um, it, the 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 objective function for learning these vectors encourages uh, vectors that encourages words that appear in similar contexts, so that that appear in the same types of sentences, uh, to have similar vectors that have a high uh, have a high dot product. Um, and when you represent words with this dot product objective uh, in this li this linear objective, um, one of the outcomes is the the vectors not only put similar words near each other, but they encode analogical relations. So dire dimen directions in the space encode meaning in in very kind of a direct sense, such that if you take the vector for man and you shift it, this, the same direction that, that moves from man to woman in the 300 dimensional space is almost identical to this, the, the, the translation between king and queen. And similarly, it will encode uh, you know, verb tense or you know, capitals of countries. Um, the, the, there's, there's a set of, of standard an analogy tasks that they provide to the word embedding model and uh, word embeddings, they, they can solve analogies almost as well as people. Um, and in our case, you can imagine that there's just like a dimension here from um, emotion, you know, uh, to cognition. And um, so we're, we're going to be trying to, to, to construct this dimension in the space. Our starting point for doing that is a seed dictionary or seed lexicon of emotional and logical words uh, from uh, LIWC, or it's pronounced Luke. Um, this is a, a, a dictionary developed by researchers at University of Texas. They're, they're linguistic psychologists, uh, and, and they validate this in a number of ways. Um, but uh, for our purposes, we have these two pretty big dictionaries of words that are 800 tokens uh, for, for what they call cognitive processing. This is what you would call kind of like logical reasoning, in, in, including causation, comparison, 
a probability, inclusion, and exclusion, these types of words. I'll show you some examples. Uh, affective processing, uh, which is, you know, emotions, like emotions and moods. Uh, it has 1,400 tokens in, in that it's like examples include anxiety, anger, sadness, positive, negative, things like this. Um, so we, we do some pre-processing on these uh, to include nouns, adjectives, and verbs. And the resulting lexicon has 359 cognition tokens and 848 emotion tokens. Uh, and I should mention that we, we read through these and we dropped any words uh, that um, uh, were, were kind of false positives in, um, in, in, our, in our context. So an example is um, the, the word admire, um, like this, uh, this like wild card expression <laughs> is considered um, emotional, and it's it's supposed to uh, it's supposed to match to admire, admire, admiring things like this. But in our case, it matches to admiral, like the, like the leader of of the navy. Uh, and so we 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 read through all of those and made sure that they weren't included. Uh, but the um, the the output of this process is we combine this dictionary with our word embeddings um, to produce a. a an affective centroid and a, and a cognitive centroid. So these are the, the these, this is the the average embedding, the average vector for these these constellations of uh, logical and emotional words. This is what the these the, this is what the uh, um, emotional and cognitional uh, centroids look like. So these are these are emotional here on the left. These are cognition or like logic uh, or reason over here. And you can see that I all we also uh, split them up by positive and negative just to show that there's that this isn't capturing sentiment. So here are the positive valent uh, words and here are the negative valent words. Um, so you can see that the, the, it's, it's capturing, uh, you know, you look at these word clouds and you and you can kind of I think you might be able to guess what what it's capturing. Um, that uh, you know these are the more emotional words over here. You know, gaiety, smile, thrill, serene, but also frightened, disgust, stupid, angry, vile. And then on the right hand, you have like characteristic, discern, analytic, infer, contradictory, imply, vague. So you can see that there's kind of like these both positive and negative valent words um, uh, for each centroid. Um, and we we did measure uh, sentiment. And um, uh, but uh, it, it turns out that uh, the the this, this, the sentiment dimension is is not um, is not that correlated with uh, emotionality. So how do we go from these uh, these emotion and cognition uh, centroids to scoring speeches in the congressional record? The first step is to represent each document each speech by a congressman in the same space. So recall that we have these average vectors in, in this type of space, representing these poles here. And you know, we want to say, take, a, take some speech and put it on this scale. And the way we do that is we take the average of the word embeddings in that speech. And so you, know, you can imagine that uh, there's a set of words in each speech. They all have a vector, uh, and we average them. And uh, the the only um, the only slight uh, uh, wrinkle is that we we um, we we add a weighting term following this this uh, NLP paper uh, that uh, it 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 increase it it downweights very frequent words. So more more informative or distinctive words uh, get are up, up weighted in the document vector. Um, we did some we did some validation of this. This, this turns out not to be critical. Uh, you don't need to do the weighting. Um, so now we have a um, we have a vector in the space going from affect to, to cognition, right? And um, we want basically we want to see for a given document vector what is What's what's the cosine of that angle? So if if um, if a document vector is 
kind of moving towards if a document is close to the affect relatively close to the affect dimension and relatively far from the cognition dimension they're going to have a, a, um, a small angle and that will result in a high cosine similarity uh, and uh, similarly if it if a document is closer to the cognitive vector um, so this is just um, uh, some some linear algebra taking advantage of the geometric representation of language that we've done uh, to, to prepare this, uh, this measure. Uh, we also do a uh, just a simple ratio of similarities that's that's really similar. So here are some examples of the most um, emotive and most logical sentences in our corpus. So you see, for example, uh, the key to whether or not we are going to be successful in ending what is a national disgrace is those of you who are watching this program today and others. Or let's do our part, my fellow Americans, and make this a better country today before we go to bed tonight as a tribute to our brave men and women who are fighting for us around the clock. So these are like, you know, really emotionally intense. And I, I think these are useful, right? Because they're not saying I'm happy. They're not saying I'm angry. Um, they're, they're expressing emotion. So I, I think it, you know, it shows what it's capturing. And uh, the, the cognitive sentences, uh, they're talking about kind of procedural issues or you know, appropriation requests for Indian irrigation projects. Um, you know, the, the these also make sense. So uh, we we don't just trust our these <laughs> a handful of examples though. We sampled random sentences and asked. Uh, we we did a crowdsourcing human validation task uh, where native English speakers on MTurk uh, looked at snippets of two. Uh, they looked at at two sentences and and we asked them. Uh, which of these sentences is more emotive uh, than the other? And then uh, we just uh, uh, we we validated our measure by asking how often does the ranking provided by our scale our score how much does it match with human ju uh, judgment? And uh, so this is you know kind of what they would see like um, they they would they would see two sentences and then they would guess which one was more emotional and then or they would say I don't understand. And the results are very, are quite good, or we, or we, we thought so. Um, that um, in the whole sample, the the our our score matches human judgment about eighty seven percent of the time. In the set of sentences where where the the where two coders agreed about about a sentence, it's even more accurate. And for the purposes of historical analysis, uh, it's important that this this high accuracy, it holds across all the decades of our data set. So this is back in the 1860s. So this is, you know, 150 years ago. Uh, our, the, our emotion uh, measure, it captures, it properly ranks the sentences even that far back in time. Um, okay, that's uh, also uh, just as, as an aside, we produced rankings um, we, we produce this human validation using the same method as this paper in, uh, in uh, American Political Science Review that came out just now. It's, it's um, uh, basically this um, method, and, and our, our method is significantly more accurate at replicating human judgment. Okay, that's the measure of emotionality, and um, I think I have about 11 minutes left, so that's good to have time to report the results. So first, here's emotionality by chamber over time. So you can see in green, that's the house, and in red, that's the Senate. And uh, you know, uh, for, for people, for students of US politics, the fact that the house is more emotional than the Senate is actually pretty intuitive. Uh, the Senate is kind of the more deliberative body. And you know, we see some interesting uh, just initial uh, regularities here that uh, uh, emotion tends to go up when there's a during wars. So like World War One, World War Two, there's these spikes at the time that the U.S. is joining these wars. Um, and then you know we we saw this and we weren't sure about it. We thought there maybe was a problem with our measure because there's just this unexpected shift, like really big uh, increase starting around 1978. And we were wondering what was going on there. Um, and uh, there, there's a few different things, of course, but something that I think was really salient for our case is that there's is C-SPAN is, is coming on. So C-SPAN is this television network uh, that put the, the, flo the floor speeches uh, on, on TV, on cable TV, 
And um, it really was right around that time uh, when uh, the emotionality went up. Um, and uh, in case it comes up. Um, uh, sorry, uh, I, I have a question actually about this. Uh, yeah, sure. How, how do you explain this uh, dip before the, the rise? In the, this. Yeah. This. Uh, yeah, no, I, that, that's striking too as well, right? Um, the yeah. um, I, I, I don't I don't have a good uh, thought for that. Um, because I mean, this is right around, you know, this, you know, the late 1960s, the early seventies, this was like, a, like during Vietnam, this was a very, you know, uh, divisive time. So it's kind of striking that emotionality would be going down. Right. Um, so yeah, th 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 this is an interesting puzzle that we, you know, uh, um, we, sh we should, we should think about. Do, do you have any idea about why that would be? Uh, no, I was I was just thinking about the Vietnam yeah. War, but I uh, yeah, but I, I did not understand like why it was maybe they were trying to counterbalance the like what, yeah. I mean, this was you know this is like um you know I guess like um you know I guess in Watergate and stuff like that. I don't know maybe 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 it's some of like the legal discussion around there. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure, uh, but uh, we 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 should check that. Um, so I, I just wanted to mention that um, these these trends are not explained by sentiment. So it's not them becoming more positive or negative. They're also not explained by readability or kind of text textual sophistication. So it's not like they're using you know more more. It's not that, it's not that they're using simpler language, um, which you also might expect. But it's not it's not uh, explained by that. Um, it's you can see like that's that has a very different trend, um, and. Uh, also, it's not driven by something something happening in larger society. So, if if we look at Google Ingrams, which is you know basically Google Books, there's a much different trend where it's actually just it's actually just been going down rather than going up. Also, uh, this effect of C-SPAN, you know, this you just this, you wouldn't just trust this time series, right? Uh, but we actually have some initial causal evidence uh, that um, it's a causal effect because. Uh, we followed the method in Martin Yurikoglu, uh 2017 AAR paper, where uh, you instrument viewership of, of C-SPAN based on the channel position in the sense that when, when uh, C-SPAN has a lower channel position, people watch it more uh, because it's easier to access. And it turns out that uh, in places um, where C-SPAN has a lower channel position, people watch, uh, people watch it more and there's a uh, higher emotionality in those congress congressional districts. Uh, so this is very new. We haven't uh, you know, done all of the checks yet, but um, I'm, I'm pretty excited about this, <laughs> that, um, uh, that uh, C-SPAN could be this, this driving force in making and uh, shaping the ret rhetorical choices of, of congressmen. So uh, a few more descriptive results. And we can come back to the C-SPAN thing at the end if you guys want. Um, so here's uh, emotionality by topic. So we trained um, LDA, which is a, um, a standard topic model that it learns clusters of, of related words from the text. And you can see that, uh, you know, th they're all, most of them are pretty low, especially procedure. So this is like, you know, when they're talking about who should vote now and stuff like that, it's kind of a nice placebo test that that has actually stayed low during the whole time period. Uh, but what has increased a lot is like this national narrative topic, which is like, um, you know, the American dream, uh, we should salute the troops, things like this. Uh, something that I think is interesting for economists is we ranked the topics by how uh, partisan they are in terms of their emotionality. So what's the ratio of uh, Republican emotionality that, that's over here? Republicans are more emotional about these topics. Uh, versus the topics where Democrats are more emotional. And you can see that fiscal policy uh, is the most uh, is, is the most emotive topic, is the most partisan topic in terms of its emotionality, which I think is very interesting um, because you know Republicans have had to defend, have had to come up with all of these arguments and narratives to defend extremely high inequality in the US. Um, and uh, you see that in their emotional defenses of, of a regressive fiscal policy. Um, and then uh, on the other hand, Democrats, they get emotional about social issues. So this is like, uh, you know, discrimination and abortion and things. Um, and uh, also economic policy, which is like um, uh, labor unions and things like that. 
So we also looked at uh, the level of emotionality by the minority and majority status of the political parties. So you might think that um, you know when when parties are out of power, they have to attack the incumbents, uh, and so they might be more emotional. And we see that. So uh, this actually, you know, this graph we were pretty happy with. Whenever there's a change in power, so like blue means a Democrat majority, uh, red means a Republican majority the other party becomes more emotional. So you can see it's like really, um, uh, you know, striking here. Like when when they trade places in terms of like they're being the majority party, uh, they use more or less emotional rhetoric. You can see it switches here, it switches again. Um, and this isn't driven by the topics or like using more or less procedural words. So it holds when you when you control for um, uh, control for, for topic fixed effects. I have a quick question on that. Yeah. Um, is it something about composition effects or it has nothing to do with it? So I guess there is turnover in those houses, in those. Uh, um, so could you characterize each uh, Congress uh, member by some, uh, you know, the emotion uh, score and see whether it's driven by changes in the composition or just. Um, no, it's not because th these regressions have speaker fixed effects. So even oh, okay. like within, within the same, per but that's a great question within the same person. If they're in the minority or majority, they use more or less emotion. I see. Um, I see. And, and you and we control for whether it's divided government, like the length of the speech, so like kind of sophistication and also sentiment, and it's still it's still there. I see. I see. So but this, this, this seems to be a rhetorical strategy for the minority. Yeah, I see. I see. But the fact that between columns two and three, if I understand correctly, you have this kind of, uh, and it's. Yeah. Different. Oh yeah, right. So, so the, 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 this, this, the, these columns show you that the topic fixed to make fix make a difference, right? So, what the kind of the the, the topics they are talking about do, does make a difference, mm -hmm. and also there's there there is there seems to be a composition effect. Yeah, actually, so that, that's that, that's quite interesting. I, I I had not noticed that before, but but we we, we should mention that in the draft. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Victor. Um. So. Also, you know, somewhat thematically related to kind of being in the minority or being kind of under pressure and, and also being more emotional is that when you look at the DW nominate scores, um, these are these are um, measures of polarization, policy polarization based on your roll call votes. Uh, the, the the congressmen and senators who are higher up or lower up on DW nominate are also more emotional. So basically, these are these are the congressmen here that like. They're, they're, they're really right wing. These are the congressmen over here that are really left wing, you know, like Bernie Sanders and stuff like that. And uh, they tend to use more emotional language uh, rel uh, relative to their colleagues uh, who are towards the middle of DW nominate. Uh, th this also holds with the, with the, the, the different fixed effects. Uh, finally, this is just some final descri uh, uh, descriptive evidence uh, that, you know, uh, th there could be many reasons for this, of course, but, um, you know, when you control for all the other observables, uh, Democrats are more emotional. So are female congressmen. Uh, Black and Hispanic congressmen are more emotional. Asians are less, uh, and, uh, and Catholics are more, and there's no effect of, of, for Jews. So to sum up, we have this new measure of emotive versus cognitive speech that combines um, dictionary methods with word embeddings. Uh, we have a, a package on my GitHub um, that's already pretty usable, um, and um, uh, you're welcome to check it out. And if you have any requests, we will we'll add that. Um, we, we show that this emotionality measure it uh, is kind of intuitive, um, and it has helped us answer some some start to answer some interesting substantive questions, such as what is the impact of television on emotionality? Um, are there links to polarization? Uh, we also uh, have already tried it on, on Twitter, uh, and you get some pretty nice results there, too, um, where these are the most emotional uh, uh, tweets we can see. Like, uh, it is heartbreaking that our children and their families are facing such hateful rhetoric and unprecedented targeting. Um, so uh, this, this, we can already show that it, it seems to work pretty well in other, other corpora. Uh, and that's my presentation. Thank you.